Hi, this is Andy and Sharon McClellan from Father's House. Welcome to this teaching session. We pray that you will be blessed and grow as a result of listening today. So today, the uh, title is My Will, My Word, My Way. Now, before um, before I did the sermon, I knew I was going to be speaking this week, and I was starting to think about last week, and I had a few thoughts on what I should speak on. Uh, preaching is not something I always find easy, or I don't find it easy at all, and I, and I appreciate that it's a big responsibility and a big honour uh, that comes with giving a message, and so I'm very careful on how it's delivered. I'm a bit of a joker at times, but actually very, very unsure sometimes whether to have a joke within the sermon because I think it's important that the message gets across more than anything it's something to be taken seriously so sometimes it's a whisper in my ear or something I've read or stuck struck a chord or a study that I've done so as I say I had a few ideas and then I actively instead of just doing that I actively asked God what you uh, what what to say so i say uh, um so what you're going to hear and experience is based on the journaling that followed actually the journaling didn't take very long in itself um and i think the words that i received show the importance of seeking god's will first rather than speeding forward to a, an, an a potentially unanointed talk or a preach so um I'd leave it for you to decide whether to discover if I actually succeeded in that. Um, the Bible says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. And that's the whole crux of things, really, is that we seek God first. The whole sermon centres on communication between God and us and how we communicate with others as a result, how we meet the needs of others. Christians and also those that haven't encountered or met Jesus yet. So my starting block with with journaling um, was I literally wrote, Lord, what should I speak on? <laughs> what should I speak on? That was it. No, um, I had no idea really of what he was going to say. And the response is as follows. I've changed some of the 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 way in which the word slightly so it's clearer. But it says to know what I should speak on is only possible if I know his will. This requires me to listen to what he is saying, along with reading his word, the word of God, which is the Bible. He said, my will, my word. To hear my, to hear my word and act on it. To find that out, you have to ask. And how... He said, how to find it, you have to ask. How can you know another's will without asking? How can you know their feelings without inquiring? You have to ask, otherwise it's guesswork. So <laughs> that was the start of my, my journaling. It's polite to ask God how he feels and to ask him for direction. When we count other people, he can guide us. When we're looking for answers, we can bring appropriate responses and also when we need help ourselves um, we have Christ in us to help us to guide us we have the Holy Spirit to guide us we have the Bible to guide us but Jesus sets an example for this the Bible says then in John 5 19 to 20 then Jesus answered and said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of himself, but what he sees the father do. For whatever he does, the son also does in like manner. For the father loves the son and shows him all things that he himself does, and he will show him greater works than these that you may marvel. That's John 5, 19 to 20. This, this analogy I was given, which is a doctor cannot know whether the medication is working on a patient without asking, observing the condition of the person. And he can also make mistakes by not asking in the right way. Recently, I read a book by a friend of mine called, she's called Dr. Curie Scott, and she wrote a book, Arts for, for Drawing Health. And she gives an example in there um, of uh, a body body map like a, a picture of a body and 
you would you ask the person who's got the illness or the sickness or whatever to, to actually draw on on the map what they're feeling it might be the symptoms it might be pain etc and the whole premise of um her book is about using it for help to help people get healthy the example of the body map is is good because it allows the person to communicate different parts of the body where there's problem going on etc whereas the doctor may ask the patient in a, in a wrong way he may not ask the right questions he may say tell me about the pain in your neck and it could be that the pain is completely related to something it could be something else that's happening in the body that he's missed because he's just focusing on the manifestation of the pain so it's the same it's the same when we come into contact with people we we may not ask the right questions you've got to ask the right questions you've got to you've got to know you only need to ask the father to give you direction on what to ask and when to ask it so from that example you've got that um the illness or pain could be due to unforgiveness for instance as an example of something somebody could be suffering a lot of pain and it could be unforgiveness the, the person may even be oblivious to what's causing the problem but it could be things like unforgiveness that's quite a good example in fact i i worked when i worked in the ymca i met somebody that was completely contorted through unforgiveness and blaming everybody else for their situation and it it was it was very frustrating um and you can see how it happens so the question needs to be asked with the right motive not to satisfy the questioner but to get to the truth to find the solution so as you can see i'm what i'm trying to do here is to show you what god was saying to me what's it's about how we communicate with him and how he talks to us and how he leads us to help other people and ourselves as well so the answer God gives us may vary according to the situation. And a good example of that was Moses when God told him to strike the rock and the water came out on the rock. And then another time happened and Moses did the same thing again on a different occasion without asking the father. And the problem with that is it becomes religion. If we look at Jesus in comparison and how people are healed, they're healed they're healed in different have different responses and the similar they can be in the same similar situation or same illnesses or the same i've read that again shall i in comparison look at jesus how people are healed different responses to the similar or the same situations or miracle different cures for apparently the same conditions jesus seeks the father's guidance and communicates with the people in different ways we can cut that other bit out later can't we so if we look at Matthew 8, 1 to 3, it says, so that's Matthew 8, 1 to 3, it says, When he came down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him, and behold, a leper came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And then Jesus put his hand and touched him. Jesus put out his hand and touched him. He touched the leper. He put out his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing be cleansed immediately the leprosy was cleansed I find this really interesting this passage because um for a start Jesus uses here minimal amount of words I think sometimes we can um get caught up I think you have to press in as well so I'm not saying that but sometimes we can get caught up and it, sometimes it's simple prayer he says I am willing be cleansed he knows what to say and when to say it also he touched him he touched a leper and this made me think about um recent events when um we were isolated and couldn't do certain things and we were distanced for a common cold but jesus drew closer to a man who had leprosy it's a bit different really so i just think and the opposite happened to what we might think in the human sense Jesus didn't get sick, the man got well. So it's opposite, opposite thing here. So then I look, because what I did was I'd show you my, I'd, you probably can't really see this anyway, but these are all my, these are all my crazy notes. Where is it? I'm making it look like it was more than it was. It's only at the back here. 
But then I looked at all the different miracles and put all the miracles down that Jesus did. The internet's great for finding things out quickly, isn't it? So then we had the 10 lepers, which is the next one, which is in um, Luke 17, 11 to 17. Now it happened he went to Jerusalem. Um, it happened that as he went to Jerusalem, that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. Then as he entered a certain village, there met 10 men who were lepers, who stood afar off. And the, I don't know what version this is, afar off. But there you go. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. So when he saw them, he said to them, go show yourself to the priests. And it was, it was that as they went, they were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, returned with a loud voice and glorified God. I think a loud voice is probably used to shouting at people from a distance. I don't know. He glorified God and fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. So Jesus answered and said, were you there not, were there not 10 cleansed, but where are the nine? Were there not any found who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, arise, go your way. Your faith has made you well. Dif same condition as the previous person, different solution. Just think it's quite interesting. And then we go now to Mark 8, 22 to 26. Um, this is another situation. This is a blind man healed at Bethesda, at Bethesda. Then he came to Bethesda and they brought a blind man to him and begged him to touch him. So he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the town. I think it's quite interesting. I'd like, I think you could do quite a good Bible study on why he took him out of the town. I don't really know. I looked at that and I've been puzzling that one. He took him by the hand out of the town. And when he had spit on his eyes, he put his hands on him and asked him if he saw anything. And he looked up and said, I see men like, I see men like trees walking. So then he put his hands on his eyes again and made him look up and he was restored and saw everybody clearly, everyone clearly. Then he set him away to his house saying, neither go into the town nor tell anyone in the town. It's very, like I said, it's very interesting why he wanted him to stay out of the town. I think he didn't want him to, I don't know. I don't know the reason. I think you can work that one out. Answers on a postcard. Right. Then we go to a man born, born blind who received sight. Now, as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? This is John 9, 1 to 12, by the way. I think I might start that again. Now, as Jesus passed by, John 9, 1 to 12, as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth, and his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born that he was born blind? And Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed to him. This was an opportunity. I'm not saying that it was fixed this way, but this is an opportunity for Christ to show who he was and, and, and the purpose of healing and, and some of the the ways in which people thought at that time about people with sicknesses and diseases and things. He said, neither this man nor his parents sinned, but the works of God should be revealed in him. So this was a great opportunity. To, and it kind of reveals Christ's identity and his purpose, actually, for what he was sent for, as you read on. I must work, I must work the works of him who sent me. So back to the Father again. He's back to the Father for asking what to do. I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. It's literally, I suppose, it's light of the world, but it's also physically light coming into this man's life, which is kind of interesting, isn't it? Interesting language. So when he said this, said these things, he spat on the ground and made clay with saliva, and he anointed the, the eyes of the blind man with clay, and he said to him, Go in the walk, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated sent. 
So he went and washed and came back seeing. So Jesus was sent, and to hammer the point home, he sent the man, the Paul named sent, to wash off his eyes. This is, this is Jesus revealing himself. I've been sent to you to do this. I've been sent to the, to the earth to, to tell people about me. You even go to the place called Sent, the pool called Sent. Then we have Luke 18, 35 to 43. Then it happened as he was coming near Jericho that a certain blind man sat by the road begging and hearing a multitude passing by, he asked what it meant. So they told him that Jesus of Nazareth was passing by. And he cried out saying, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And then those that went before him warned him that he should be quiet. But he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on, on me. And I was actually thinking about this this morning. Um, when, I, when I got up, I just added my added on my, to my notes because I, I thought it's interesting that we have, we have two, we have two options. We either go off into a corner and quietly go about our lives being crippled or diseased or whatever, or we call out to Jesus. Do we get put off by those people that would say, oh, no, you can't shout to the vicar or you can't ask this, you can't ask that. Well, do you, what do you do? Do you just shrink, shrink and die? Because mm -hmm. I don't know if I really could be bothered to ask Jesus. No, you actually ask. You shout out. You ask. You go vigorously. So that's what he did. So what happened? So Jesus stood still. I think it's interesting that Jesus actually stood still. Um, because. He could have gone to the man, but he didn't. So Jesus stood still and he commanded him to be brought to him. And when he had come near, he asked him, saying, what do you want me to do for you? Now, I think if I was in that situation, um, the, I wouldn't be asking, necessarily asking, that, well, duh, it's pretty obvious, isn't it? Pretty obvious you want to see. Well, no, Jesus doesn't assume anything. He actually says what do you want me to do for you and i think part of that thing of saying what do you want me to do for you is actually the act of faith he actually actually are he has to actually ask um a while ago when back when pope's down i think somebody once came they had asked people to come up for prayer and this guy came up with one artificial leg and came up to the front for healing and the guy that was at the front said to him um what what do you want healing for what do you want and he said it's my leg and the guy was like panicking he's like he's got an artificial leg and he's asking for a leg and he inquired more and the man said oh, it's my it's for my good leg i'm having a lot of problems with my good leg i want prayer for it now i think both of those things are valid um but it's being specific and asking the right question isn't it what i mean he could, it could, I don't know, you could be in the same situation and see a blind man. He said, actually, I want to be delivered of these. I've got some demonic stuff going on. I want to be delivered from it, couldn't he? It could have been anything. Or it could have been that he wanted prayer for somebody else that was in his family. You don't know. But Jesus actually asked the question. It's his faith to actually ask. He has to actually ask for himself. And he said, Lord, that I may receive my sight. And then, then Jesus said to him, receive your sight. It's a really complex prayer. Receive your sight. Your faith has made you well. God, all these things you have to learn in church to reach people and to pray for people. Go get exactly the right words. I mean, come on. Really? Is that it? Is that all we can say? receive your sight? Your faith, your faith has made you well. Now, I can memorize that. Maybe. I don't know. We just like we complicate things, don't we? Anyway, he immediately received his sight, so the spoiler alert, and followed him, glorifying God. And all the people, when they saw it, gave praise to God. Well, there you go. So we've had, I don't know, is that the third blind man we've had? So anyway, and all, all different responses. Yeah, so John 5, 19, 20 again. So then Jesus answered and said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of himself 
but what he sees the father do for whatever he does the son also does in like manner for the father loves the son and shows him all things that he himself does and he show he will show him greater works than these than you than you may mark that you may marvel or like a bit of marveling don't we we need to marvel more i think we want to see more of this stuff i'd be quite happy to marvel more when people got healed right so the bible says thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven so is this a coordination between the coming together between heaven and earth is it like um the, the reunite, reuniting of the two in that moment where heaven and earth come together and god heals in heaven and and then we're like bringing healing on earth is it i don't know i just something that kind of came to me as i wrote it down so we ask and we seek god through our lives to an extent where we we only do what we see the father doing we do more and more of this kind of thing i think sometimes you see it's quite difficult i mean lydia's been writing letters and things like that for jobs and stuff recently our daughter and it's all about um, getting the words right. Is this sound right? Does that sound, sound too pushy? Should I put, the, oh, should I change this? What about if I do that? And you hum and you ha and you, you wonder whether the letters are ever going to get written or the, the things are ever going to be done because you're fiddling around with every little nuance. But if we relied on God and asked him, then we wouldn't have to think about it. We spend an awful lot of time you know, thinking about how we should do things correctly, which is not a problem, but I think if we ask him, if he guides us, then we haven't got to think so much, have we? It's, it's trusting him. It's not always... One of the things that happened... I was going to read this, read this in a sec. When, when we, we had Toronto hit um, some years ago, Toronto Blessing, as it was called, um, one of the things that I noticed was that we started to get into... A religious mindset and what i mean by that was you had to be you had to be standing if you wanted to get prayer there's nothing wrong with that i'm just saying it became a thing and you had people always pray the same thing which is top of the head tip of the toe pray and it's really easy to see how you can get into a religious way of thinking you can you, and one of the things that came out through the journaling was this is actually the, what was said. Was, it's not always praying top of the head to the tip of the toe. If you're not careful, you start to develop ministry of blueprints, otherwise known as religions. Now, you do have ways of doing things, but also it's about hearing what God's saying. We, we, do, we do healing of the blind this way, or we do this that way. And instead of actually, God, what do you want us to do? Well, how do you want us to do this? Um. Now, this next bit I wrote down from the journaling and I changed it and I changed it back because I, I don't want to. I don't want to change what I was told because I don't want to get it wrong. So it's as, as so it's blueprint as opposed to. As opposed to following the true prints, true prints, like not the blueprints, the true prints where you operate in conjunction with Jesus and the father, my way, my word. So we do it his way we don't just fall back on some blueprint thing that we've done before it's a true print i put footprints in there and then i thought better not do messing around with it too much i don't want to lose because there might be somebody out there that says true prints actually speaks to me it might it might bring you back memories that did with me of, of really rubbishy photographs where i got the finger in the way and everything else and you just get your your pictures done from an old camera you have all these terrible pictures and they weren't very good good um prints of what actually happened <laughs> terrible mm. so um yeah so true prince is seeking response specifically engineered to reach the person's need they are not always the same solutions for the need he god says god said as he was talking to me or through this journaling he says don't miss me out of the equation tricky one eh so the things I got was ask me first and wait for a response. What is the problem or situation? How do I respond and what do I say? They were the headings I got. So why do you deal with every problem or situation with the same, same response and expect results? 
you can't you cannot learn you have to ask if you miss me out of the of the ask you miss out the response and the progress that can be made what is your motivation is it to see them made whole for their benefit and for their glory i'm sure that's pretty much most of us would want that of god or boost you up and provide you and with another story the best stories come from the person from the person with testimony who was healed and we we've heard some really great testimonies uh within our church and it's been great and it has power there is power in testimony there's no doubt about it so what god was communicating to me was that we ask him and how we approach people and ask what to say this means we have to learn to listen and observe his will when we interact with him so the next one i've got is uh the woman at the well and i felt i should do this one i'm not quite 100 percent sure why but i quite like the story as well and i just think it's a it's a great testimony in itself so if we look at this it's in um let me get the verse chapter and verse for you oh it's very long hang on a minute i'm going to get you the exact verse eventually i can't see where i've written it i'm going to carry on going through it it's a woman at the well anyway uh so now jesus had had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When the Samaritan woman when when a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. I think it's interesting the timing that the disciples are out of the way at this point I, it's i'll go over that in a minute but i think that's quite interesting and the samaritan woman said to him you are a jew and i am a S samaritan woman how can you ask me for a drink for jews do not associate with samaritans and the samaritans come up quite a lot today haven't we quite interesting jesus answered answered her if you knew the gift of god and who it is that asks you for a drink you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. I just love, I just love all these interactions. They're great, aren't they? I think, I think you should look at these when you read, it's just to look at them in a purely kind of human way and how this kind of dialogue happens. It's great. And especially when the Bible is some great dialogue. I mean, I quite like listening to people's conversations. I'm quite a, I do listen when I'm in crowds and I listen to conversations, it's quite interesting. So the woman said, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock? He doesn't, I just think, he's think, oh, yeah, yes, I am, I am, I'm him. No, he doesn't do that. He's, he just... He he lets her come to realization with of who he is as it goes along through the dialogue. Jesus continues the dialogue, and and we we can really we really get to see what um, her understanding. She has a lot of understanding about where she lives and the history of the well, and I liked her practical reasoning. I like the way she re reasons with Jesus, and in fact, it reminded me a little bit of Nicodemus and Jesus discussing how a man can be reborn how can how can you be born again it's kind of it's kind of those sort of discussions which i think are quite interesting so yeah so if she didn't know who he was was he before this he may she may not have dealt with all the aspects that she needed to deal with and she didn't she needed to hear some other stuff really from him as well which i think is great jesus answered her everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become, become in them a, a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Now, the woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. I bet she was so fed up. Climb, climb, walk into this place. I don't know why I always think it's on a hill. Is it on a hill? I don't know. But I, don't, I kind of feel like she's trudging there in the heat of the day because she has to come when nobody else is around. And uh, she has to keep drawing this water. Well, if you actually can get it on tap, um, yeah, I'll take that. 
it's a spiritual thing here as well but you know just like i just think physically i suppose that's like with the sin isn't it in your in your life it's it's a trudge but if you can get living water and be cleansed from your sin you've got less to carry you don't have to keep lugging things backwards and forwards to satisfy your thirst so the woman said to him sir give me this water so that i won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water he told her go call your husband and come back and she said i have no husband she replied and jesus said to her you're right when you say you have no husband the fact is you have five husbands and the man you know now have is not your husband what you have just said is quite true so jesus knows this stuff god's told him this stuff he knows all this stuff <clears throat> but he doesn't come in there and start condemning her he lets her tell her story she says, sir, sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but your, you Jews claim the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. Hey, that's great for us as Gentiles, isn't it? It's great. You Samaritans worship that you did what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshippers will worship the Father, Father in the Spirit and in truth. But they are the kind of worshippers the Father seeks. Wow. <laughs> Isn't that great? Um, God in the Spirit and his worshippers must worship in the Spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that that Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. And then Jesus declared, I am the one speaking to you and I am he. Wow. <laughs> Dear me. You know those moments when you get your stomach kind of goes up. What do you feel? You know, I'll be from those moments like dong. In fact, you might have heard a dong in the back. Dong. It hits. The messages hit. Hit. And then what she do, she the thing that she has to transport the water back, she throws the jar on the floor and she goes, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, come see a man who told me everything that I ever did. How did he know? Could this be the Messiah? So they came out of the town and made their way towards him. They said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves and we know that this man really is the saviour of the world. It's John 4, 1 to 22, in case you wanted to know, but I'm sure you all found it anyway. So, the question I had was, why did Jesus get rid of the disciples? And I had a little think about this. The whole situation, the whole situation she finds herself with Jesus is a metaphor in order to reach, in order to reach her with living, about living water. It's all a setup. <laughs> God, God's the master at setting things up and he set this up beautifully and uh, she had to get the water she had to get the water for jesus there's nobody else there the disciples had gone off to get some food to spend some money and buy some food and um they i think they would have got in the way because she was samaritan and they would say well you don't want to talk to her she's a samaritan but it says in the passage which i obviously skipped through a little bit when the disciples, when his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with the woman, but no one asked, what do you want? Or why are you talking with her? <laughs> I don't think, see, I don't think uh, you'd want to be doing that with Jesus. If you know who he is, <laughs> you, don't, you don't question, do you? Anyway, water was a metaphor to reach her. Sometimes we can be more effective speaking one-to-one. -one. It's not about the show, it's about the message. And part of the Part of the message was how it all happened. You know, it's part of the whole message. So, um, I was I was thinking back um, to when we did we done regatta in the past. Some I don't know how many years ago, maybe three years ago, maybe longer than that. I don't know, maybe four years. Ago. Anyway, Sharon, we did the regatta in Christchurch, and Sharon said to me. I used to do cartooning. I did some cartooning for the kids, get them occupied and hopefully got them to the stand and get them prayer and things like that. But then one year she says to me, why don't you do prophetic art? So I consulted um, 
about how to do this on YouTube. Didn't actually ask God, I just went on YouTube. That gives you the answer to everything, isn't it, really? Uh, and I could find nothing on prophetic art in the way in which Sharon was talking about, which is where you draw the picture in front of the person um, and give the prophetic word to go with it. It, it was, um, all I could find was people painting big pictures at the front of churches and doing that kind of prophetic art. This is a face-to-face -face thing. Wow, real scary stuff. So, the, so I had to literally um, launch out and do it and see the picture that I got and then to interpret. The thing is that I'm going to explain that a bit more later on, but people, you know, people want to see, they want to marvel, they want to see that God's real and be amazed. They want to know, they want to know it's true. You see, it's, it's a partnership with us and God through the Holy Spirit, he speaks to us. And they want to see that encounter. They want to see how this affects them. Is, is the God, is God out there in some pie in the sky thing? Or is he real? And does he care about me? That's what people want to know, really, really and truly. That's what they want to know. They might be sceptical and all the rest of it is because they really want to see it. They've been hoodwinked by so many other ideas and this idea and that idea, the latest diet, the latest way to live, all these kind of things that we we get pushed onto us. They've seen all these things. They want to be amazed. They want to, they want to know God's real, not some new fad. Uh, so the, the word was, it's about my will, my word, working together to get my results and my glory. The people want the truth, and most of all, they want the encounter. They want you to prove it. You see, it's seeing what the Father sees and doing what the Father does, getting the response that the Father wants. The questions are, Father, what do you want? What do you want me to do? How do you want me to do it? When do you want me to do it? You don't need to take notes on this. These are ordinary questions that people can ask. You know, you, this is a conversation, isn't it? It's a conversation. See, it's asking the right questions and asking for the answers and to do what you're asked to do. My will, my word, my way. You see, you are part of the story. You have a part to play, but also be prepared to make mistakes. They are inevitable. Don't be scared, fearful. Don't be static. Take a risk. Better to be on fire and make mistakes than to be lukewarm and do nothing. That's my words. That's what I got in the journal. But that was the end of what the journaling came back to me on. So now we've established that, we need to establish how you hear from God. See, it seemed so easy up to that point, didn't it? Now we have to actually listen to what God say. Uh, yeah, it's fine, Andrew, but how do we do it? Well, one way you can do it is by, by sit, sort of sticking around other people like Sharon with me and the, and the prophetic art, is to actually help people and nurture them and, and help them to learn to hear what to expect and and all the rest of it. So last year, Mary and I did ETP, which is equipping the prophets. Now, if you haven't signed up for this, you can still do it. I believe that there's still places there, Sharon. Is I'm getting a nod? Yes, the thumbs up. There are still places. Um, you want to book up pretty soon so you don't get disappointed by the whole thing and not don't miss out on your opportunity. But the course taught us more about more me and Mary more about hearing from God and ways in which God speaks. And we use this book, which we probably can't, it's probably in reverse, isn't it? Translating God by Sean Boltz. And that was the book that we use as our main book of one of our main references throughout the course. So if you want to know more about hearing God, then I would suggest you sign up for that. I wouldn't leave it too long if do it fairly quickly if you can, because it doesn't matter where you are, you can be in india or somewhere today and you can still take part in the course because you can do it because we do it online so it's not you don't have to be there in person you can do it wherever you are so the question is how can we do what the father wants if we cannot hear so how do you hear so i thought you know i've done this sort of thing before and i thought my list is going to be how long is my list going to be not that long but actually I just rattled the list off really quickly. So here's some. There's there's hundreds of different ways, I'm sure. 
And I think Andy shared that recently, how many different ways there were. Somebody's done a calculation about how many different ways God speaks. Ah, uh, but I've got like, I've just got a few. I've got six. Right. So number one, you've got to lay out the groundwork. Spending time with God in prayer. This is a two-way conversation. This means asking questions and waiting for a response or just listening, especially when we don't know what to ask. There you go. I was actually, I was actually remembering somebody that lived on our street that had um she she was dying basically. And I don't, I don't know what her faith was like, but she didn't know what to ask. So we gave her a holding cross. So you can just hold on to the cross. So there, you know, it's you gotta you gotta spend that time and ask what is, you know, you've got to actually have that conversation. I'm gonna hurry through now because time's moving on. Reading the Bible, not just the easy passages for i know the plans i have for you all those ones are great but read you get the whole context the storylines and the history try reading through the old testament and through the new testament i did like one book on the old testament one book on the new testament it gives you a feel um gives you a feel about the whole layout of the bible and what it's all about or a friend of ours actually well somebody who used to go to our church got a children's bible like a little, really basic kid's Bible, like, I don't know, five or six-year-old's Bible. And he went through that, looking at each little few lines of each thing, and it gave, he said it helped him. He's a very intelligent guy. It gave him a context and gave him a feel about how the whole Bible fitted together. So, you know, right, so that's reading the Bible, because that's the Word of God, okay? Uh, approach people with an attitude of love and compassion, even when they're still unlovable. God still loves them. We've got to be, when we're talking to people or we're hearing from God and everything else, we've got to do it with an attitude of love. We've got to love the people when we ask God, and God will help us to do that. Ask God to reveal people and things. Um, ask Pete God to reveal people and things to you with supernatural encounters. So he, he leads you to people. And Sharon and Andy went out last week and met up with somebody they hadn't expected to meet up with because they felt God told them to go out. So he he will rig these things for you to bump into people in fact i wrote in my notes i think i probably in a minute i don't know anyway i the reason that we started coming to the greenhouse church originally is partly because i kept on bumping into sharon and andy i didn't really know them that well but you could guarantee i would go out and i'd bump into them and there was a major factor in saying well hey Look, these guys, these are the ones. I also had a dream as well. So that's another way you can. <laughs> so be prepared to take risks when sharing what you hear. Be accountable. Find, find strong Christians who can mentor you. I had a guy called Tony Jackson who helped mentor me with the Holy Spirit and tongues and stuff like that. He was not, he's not a major player in the sense of the church, the whole church as a whole, but he took me to one side and helped me. So there you go. Right, so how does God speak? He speaks through the Bible, highlighting text, touches your heart, reveals truth, dreams and visions. I get lots of dreams, lots of unhelpful dreams, but I get lots of dreams and lots of visions. And that can be an open vision or it can be a vision you have in your head. And it's normally the visions I have in my head, which that's me to the prophetic art. Right, um, pictures, you can get pictures in your head. You might be that way inclined. As I already told you about the regatta, uh, one of the things we had um, we had some kids come up and they wanted prophetic drawings. And I decided with the younger ones to just do animals with a prophetic thing on. And then the mum came, mum was there as well. And I did a prophetic animal for her as well. Well, I did an animal. And Mary was there with me and I drew a leopard. And I shared some of the stuff. And Mary said to me, I, Mary said to me, you've forgotten to put the tail. And I said, that's it the tale you, you like telling stories yeah she did so it's a word of knowledge <laughs> word of knowledge by 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 just that one one moment you might have a pain in your body that um that tells you that somebody else in, in the room has got a similar issue we were on a thursday night one week and my heart rate increased and increased and increased and was really pounding and i thought this is interesting and I prayed as well. We were praying. I was praying in tongues and stuff. And then I said, I think somebody's got somebody got an issue with a heart issue. And there was only about eight, eight of us, maybe, maybe nine. It was on a Thursday night. 
and nobody nobody said oh yeah that's me and i said well it's either that or i'm having a heart problem <laughs> and it turned out the person said actually i think it is me and we got to pray with that person so that's another way in which god speaks words that come into your head it can be a single word or a whole text quite often i get things i wake up in the morning like get a word literally one word um it could be that God speaks to you through songs that come into your mind. I I won't go into details, but I had one time when I had Handel's Messiah playing in my head, and that was very much part of the word. So I'm not that I'm not that kind of classical, but I knew that a bit. Um, or it could be it could be other songs. It could be non-Christian songs that come in and give you an idea of something or a situation. See, I like I like um, for instance. Um, the Beach Boys, God only knows what I'd do without you. And I'm not quite sure if it's a, a loud song. I don't know if it's almost blasphemous, but whenever I listen to that song, I, I quite often I'm thinking about Jesus. God only knows what I'd do without you, Jesus. You know, it's just so things like that can come to you. It can be I've got two more minutes and I'll be done. Smell. It can be smells. Believe it or not. It's all your senses, you know, but in a spiritual sense. I was praying in an empty church with a good friend. We prayed at the altar. And as we left, I saw a whiff of a puff of smoke come up in front of me. And the other person smelt incense. So it's just like, wow, <laughs> that was the response to our prayer. It can be memories. It can be audible voices. When Samuel heard God speak to him, I, sometimes I've heard him, I've said, Mary, did you call me? And she says, no. So was that God's calling me? Maybe. It can be journaling. If you want to know more about journaling, um, I would well join the ETP thing. But if you look online on YouTube, there's a guy called Mark Berkler that does a couple of um, sessions, which aren't very long, about 10 minutes each, talking about how to journal. I'm not talking about just making notes in your Bible, but where God actually speaks to you and you write it down. That's what I was doing. Um, we did, did about three pages worth and um so yeah so that's how quite often i get stuff is through journaling so that's mark verkler b-i-r-k-l-e-r -E i think there's a name it can be coincidences meeting people in places meeting people in the right place at the right time sharon and andy it can be a quiet whisper internally in your head it can be nature nature speaks through creation other people can give you prophetic words or share an answer you've been praying about miracles you can miracles you pray and people are healed or you're you're healed so these are all the ways in which god speaks to us so keep asking keep listening and do it his way that's what i would say to you so i'm gonna because i don't want too long i'm gonna pray and we're gonna go back uh to the the uh the off office no back into the room with everybody else and guys if you ever want to come in and join in on the um the zoom it's great because you know together we can like talk beforehand it's great and we can build up uh you know it's a family isn't it and this is part of family is to meet up and chat it might not always be really ultra ultra what you expect or whatever but it's great just to be together so it's great that you're on facebook but tune in and come in on the zoom you can do it anywhere from in the world pretty much it's pretty amazing so anyway i'm going to close the prayer to make sure you come next time online because we want to see you it's better it's better that way it's just and the other thing is what you can't see on facebook is i'm looking at a screen here and i can see people in the room responding and it's great from my point of view as well it's great from the speaker's point of view to actually be able to see people reacting like sharon's now doing this but you can't see it but if you were in the room you could possibly see that going on you can see the responses it's part of being family okay let's close yeah, Lord, thank you that you love us so much. Thank you that you speak to us. Lord, help us to listen. Help us to listen to what you're saying and to do what you want us to do. Lord, I pray that you'd give us those, those coincidences, those moments where we can share and we can show your love and we can pray for healing. Lord, I thank you that even the smallest in man's eyes person in the, in the, in the church can still pray and people can be healed. You know, it's not like that where it, anybody can do it. And uh, as Sharon and Andy, you've got a broadcast called All May Prophesy. We can all do this, but we need to listen to God. So, Lord, I pray that you bless everybody on here today. Lord, I pray that those that 
may need help or want help or want to join on ETP will con will contact Sharon Andy on the Father's house so they can know more. Lord, I pray you bless us today as we go through the day. Thank you that you help me get through this. Thank you that you help them get through this. And Lord, I pray that you bless us throughout the rest of this week. Amen. Thank you.